Uh, fear is one of the very basic states of consciousness in which most of us live. And the reason is that fear is always of the unknown. When we don't know a thing, we are afraid. We have never been afraid by knowing a thing. When we know a thing, some other kinds of emotions, feelings and states of consciousness replace the feeling of fear. But when we don't know, we are afraid. It's a very strange conscious experience to be afraid. Because when we are truly afraid, in its technical sense, there is really nothing to be afraid of. Because there is nothing known to us to be afraid. Take the example of a guy walking through one of the Himalayan jungles, forests, in which it is known that one man-eater, the big lion, is at last. The guy will be afraid only so long as he doesn't see the lion. He doesn't know from which side he'll come, and therefore he's afraid. Once the lion appears, the feeling of fear will be replaced and substituted by a different feeling, feeling of finding ways of escape, feeling how he should run fast, feeling how he should climb a tree and get away. Completely different feelings substitute the feeling of fear, which exists till the lion is there. It's when we do not know what's going to happen that we are afraid. Now we can trace back to the experience of our own fears and we can notice how true this statement is. We have always been afraid when we did not know, when we were not sure when you we were uncertain, when we were in doubt. I have been speaking all these days about the nature of thinking and how it creates doubt and uncertainty. As a corollary, too much thinking creates fear because we become uncertain. We are not sure. We are afraid of people because we are not sure of those people. We are afraid of a guy because we don't know what he has in his mind. We have no means of knowing and therefore we are afraid. If we could see what is in other people's minds, what they are thinking about, we would never be afraid. The only real solution to the problem of fear is to gain knowledge about that of which we are afraid. Whatever causes of fear should be known and fear will disappear. Always. Fear does not stop at fear. It causes so many corollary reactions such as inferiority complex, loss of nerves, confusion, uh, depression, exhaustion. We just feel drained out. All the energy seems to go away. All the energy is drained out through the process of fear. And we feel absolutely exhausted. So many people tell me that they got so frightened that they just couldn't walk after that. Even physical energy disappeared. Energy is a strange thing. It's directly related to knowledge and joy. When we have knowledge and joy or happiness, we have abundant energy, physical, mental, spiritual, all kinds of energy. When we lose joy, happiness and knowledge, we become afraid and we become weak and energy disappears. People are trying so many experiments with energy flows. It's no use doing marginal experiments with energy flows. Just having a little energy, extra little energy, less <clears throat> various kinds of magnetic forces are used, polarity therapies are used, all kinds of small energy fields are created to improve our energy flow. Whereas one very simple omnibus solution is to just experience knowledge and joy. Try it out. You have knowledge and you have happiness and your energy is redoubled. It grows. In this country particularly, there is always the fear that our energy is being drained. I have not seen that in many other parts of the world. But here, most people are worried about the drain of energy. They do not realize that energy can flow out and back in at the same time if we are in a state of happiness and knowledge. When we know a thing and are certain about it, and we also enjoy and are happy about it, the energy flow outward is com completely negative by equal energy flow inward. We never feel weak. In fact, there is likelihood of our feeling strong. So this concept of 
an energy flow always going outward or draining you out is not correct. The energy circuits inside us are quite different. If we realize what are the energy centers in us and study them, we find they all move in circles. There is a conscious energy of our wakeful state right behind the eyes, which is responsible for most knowledge and the absence of knowledge and therefore fear. There is the energy center in the throat, which gives us imagination, dream, hallucinations. And energy flows take place through that sequence of experiences. There is the heart center, where the energy flow is very disruptive. There is the navel center. These are all focal points for flow of energy. The navel center which sustains us. And we feel, yes, we can carry on. It's the navel center energy that functions. When we eat food and feel strong, it's the navel center function. Then there's the reproductive center, which gives you creative energy. And the center, the sixth center, the rectal center, which is supposed to be the energy of evacuation. These points, which are focal points for flow of energy in the human body, if you study how energy flows through these six points, you find energy is flowing in circles around all these points. There's no such thing as energy just going. At all these focal points, energy flows in circles. And energy comes back when you are aware and happy, and energy flows out when you're ignorant and unhappy. At any one of these creative centers, at any one of these energy centers, if you are ignorant, energy goes out. If you have knowledge, energy comes back. It is not from any external source that you really need energy. It's all built within the system. These are closed circuit movement of energy. So much energy lies packed in us all the time, which we do not utilize because of lack of knowledge, because of doubts created by the mind, and therefore, because of their flow in the negative direction. And we feel so weak. All these areas of energy make us weak when we are ignorant. Fear then is basically a state of ignorance. When we don't know, we are afraid. The answer to fear is know it, get knowledge. Knowledge about what? About that which causes fear. For instance, you may be afraid what the other guy is thinking about. Get knowledge about what the other guy is thinking about. It's not difficult. If you have a sufficiently strong consciousness of your own, let anybody sit next to you, you can hear the thoughts of the other person as they are your own. It's as simple as that. You practice concentration of your own energy, attention energy, energy of awareness, behind the eyes. Merely practice being there. That means instead of letting your energy get scattered all over, you pull it back to its natural wakeful center behind the eyes. By concentrating your energy there, you become so strong and so knowledgeable and somebody else is sitting with you and talking to you, you know all the thoughts of the other person. Automatically. You can just see and you see everything about the other person. No special technique is necessary. And once you know the thoughts and you surprise the other person by telling those thoughts, you can have no fear after that. Similarly, all other elements of ignorance can be dispelled by appropriate knowledge. We can get knowledge of the entire experience around us, of the entire experience of this world through the process of knowing ourselves. Because the entire experience outside has been created from ourselves. There is a microcosm inside us which is responsible for the macrocosm outside. It is not necessary to go out for knowledge. When it's miniature, microcosmic portion lies within us. Whatever knowledge we want outside, we can go in, have a dip and get that knowledge. And once we have that, we are overcoming fear. Students of yoga and students of meditation who like to withdraw attention to themselves and like to go back to their eye center, the wakeful center, from where energy of consciousness is moving outward through attention. When they want to withdraw attention upon themselves, they are gaining knowledge of a kind which removes all fear. 
no practicing yogi has ever been afraid. You will find one who has practiced yoga and has knowledge of his own self, has sufficient knowledge of those things which cause fear and therefore is never afraid. One of the first things that goes through the process of meditation and concentration upon oneself is see, fearlessness comes in a very big way as one of the fallouts of the meditative practice. It's a very important fallout because more than half the problems of the world arise out of fear. And if we were not afraid, there would be no problems. And if we can merely, by going back and sitting in the state of knowledge within, remove fear, we have solved mo most of our problems. So it's an important thing to gain knowledge of ourselves and through that knowledge of others, thus remove fear. I might add here that our human mind uses fear not directly as a fear. Sometimes it say, I have a problem. It doesn't express fear as fear. Sometimes the fact that we do not know what's going on is not expressed as fear. It is expressed as a problem. I am bothered by that. I have a problem. I don't know what. I can't find a way out. That's how we express it. It's really fear. It's the same thing. We don't have knowledge about that. Now, in these kinds of problems, there's one little difference. When you are bothered and you have a problem, you can be sure it's with another person, not with a thing. Our human mind is so structured that we can't have a problem except with another person. Supposing there was only one human being upon this earth and all other things were merely things, homes, tables, chairs and things like that, there would be no problem. You can imagine there could be no problem. Look at all the problems we face. They arise because there is another human being. Why do problems arise because of another human being? Because we feel the other human being also thinks like us, also feels like us, also acts like us, and therefore must be having all the problems that we have. We are projecting ourselves in consciousness to another where we believe the consciousness is like ours. If we were living only amongst angels, we would never have any problems. If we were living only amongst animals, we would have no problems. If we lived amongst inanimate things, we would have no problems. It's only when we live with human beings, we have problems. Because we read the other human being according to how we read ourselves. Now, I am saying this because very often, we are not only ignorant of what the other human being has, we are putting into the mouth, into the speech of the other human being, what our own mind is speaking. If I don't like somebody, I begin to feel the other person doesn't like me. It may, be, it may not be in the other person's mind at all. But I project myself. The other day I said that if you are feeling happy and full of love and you go out, everybody is happy and full of love. It's strange. You can try it out. And if you are mad at home, you go out, you are mad with everybody. You say, what's gone wrong with the world? The world is the same. We are projecting ourselves. Why do we project? Because we know the other people, persons like us, are conscious, they are human, and they must be having the same feelings we have. A man with hatred looks, sees hatred everywhere. A man with love sees love everywhere. Therefore, to deal with this problem, we should know ourselves better. If we know ourselves better and are full of love and joy within ourselves, we will have no problem of fear again. We will have no problem. All problems and fears can be solved by knowing ourselves, by being the happy, joyful self that we are, by keeping the mind and its doubts out of the way, and through knowledge, overcoming the fear of the unknown, which is responsible for all other fears. We can read a discussion on this on this subject or any anything else you are interested. Okay. So please feel free to ask any kind of question. Any question, to, comment, discussion? Related to things we talk about in group or whatever, <clears throat> anytime. Don't hesitate to speak. We're was it quite friends. clear what I said? I was understood? And sometimes there's problem of accent and... Yes. Mm -hmm. If anybody has problem, please tell me.
Yes. Uh, I understood you just say that uh, if you if you're feeling a hatred or dislike for someone, then you might be afraid that they dislike you. I've often thought that uh, if you're afraid someone doesn't like you, sometimes it might be because you don't like yourself, so you haven't come and tuned yourself into yourself. That's right. As I said, that in order not to have hatred for others, you have to tune in with yourself. When you tune in with yourself, you cannot have hatred for anyone. If you have known yourself, you can never have hatred for anyone. We have hatred for others because we are with others, not with ourselves. Our attention is out with others. It doesn't come back to ourselves. When attention is reversed to our own self, we can never have hatred for anyone. Anyone who has been back to himself and has realized himself has no hatred at all for anyone. He has no enemies. There can be no enemies for such a person. So in essence you're saying that there is no hatred within ourselves. There is no real hatred within ourselves. It is created by projecting ourselves out and becoming afraid, becoming un unknowledgeable, ignorant about our own selves. I have a question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned about the yogis, you know, and they're knowing themselves and they're getting to know themselves through a meditative process. Now, if we go back uh, a number of years where there used to be uh, quite a bit of, in fact, I guess they still sometimes do it now, physical exercises uh, in, you might say, kind of leading to the meditative process, process. was this a purpose of physical exercises? Was it uh, an ultimate goal of physical exercises to develop control over bodily functions to eventually go into a med No, the physical exercises have always been designed for physical <coughs> fitness. Physical exercise has never been used for meditative practice. But if you are not physically fit, if your body aches or your body draws your attention, the meditative practice becomes difficult because meditative practice is the art of concentrating your attention upon yourself, yourself other than the physical body, upon your conscious self. When your physical body begins to draw your attention, the concentration of attention upon your own conscious self becomes more difficult. Therefore, it's good to have a physical body in a state of fitness before you start medical um, before you start meditational practices it is for this reason that exercises to keep the body fit were introduced but then exercises like jogging could not be used because when you are jogging you are moving away from the situation the posture a poise where you can forget about the body therefore these yogis in the orient instead of following Exercise like jogging and like doing what, uh, who does that, uh, Debbie Drake or whatever the names are <laughs> on TV day. <laughs> Those uh, 15 minute exercises. Instead of doing that, they through experience devise systems of static postures which would stretch the muscles in such a way that they would exercise every part of the body without having to run out. For example, they wanted to meditate, to concentrate their attention in an area with the least distraction in order to facilitate concentration of attention, in order to facilitate meditation. Though, therefore, they sought out caves inside rocks. They made small huts. They made log cabins and hid themselves. They made them dark, lest the light from outside should distract them. And complete darkness, they would sit inside the cave, no sound from outside, no light from outside, no distraction, no telephone rings, nothing. In those caves, they would sit and they would meditate in very congenial, facilitated atmosphere because there was no distraction, there was much less distraction. The only distraction was their mind. In that state, they wanted to practice meditation for long hours so that they could progressively withdraw their attention to themselves and themselves and not repeatedly interrupt it by having to go out for jogging, for exercises. Therefore, they found out that they could follow certain postures of the physical body, which were called asanas. Asanas means the various postures. 
they could adopt certain as asanas which would exercise the whole body within the cave. All the asanas were devised in the 84 of them, which were devised by the yogis so that they can exercise every muscle of the body and keep you in good in a good state without having to leave the cave. This was the purpose of the physical exercises in yoga. After that, they kept on the real yoga, which was mental concentration. Concentration of attention of the mind back upon themselves. And progressively, they withdrew their attention onto themselves. And even when they were very much tied down with the energy forces of the body, which was a very big problem, problem of uh, hunger was there, problem of lust was there, problem of uh, ego was there, many problems connected with the body were there, body awareness was there. In order to overcome these, they went through a process to the six centers, energy centers of the body. And they concentrated their attention through each of these centers and raised it, raised their consciousness from the bottom right up to where they were and discovered themselves through this process after overcoming the energy forces and the energy factors in the body. So this exercise business was merely to keep the body fit in which they were to do meditation. And the exercise themselves cannot do any meditation. They do not lead to any concentration. What has happened today is you read the yoga books, they only teach you exercise. And they, they miss the real yoga part. So are you saying that the exercises then don't help, do not help one to develop concentration and of attention? The exercises do not help one to develop concentration. The exercises help to keep the body fit. And keeping the body fit helps to develop concentration. Mm -hmm. To that why, extent, it does. Why is it that some individuals, particularly those who may excel in certain sports, seem to do better when their attention is concentrated? For the same reason. Their body is fit. The object is the same. Keep your body fit, you will do better in concentration because distraction on account of a body that is not so fit is reduced. It's the same thing. Like uh, now, we say a vegetarian meal should be preferred to a non-vegetarian meal if you are doing meditation. Why? Because a vegetarian meal creates conditions in the body which are less distractive to attention than a non-vegetarian meal. It's the same reason. So they create optimal conditions in which meditation can be successful. After all, you know, if you want to read a book, it needs concentration. Forget about concentration within yourself. Look at concentration on a difficult textbook, a technical book you're reading. And you can read at a certain rate. You can read at a minute a page or say two minutes a page. And you keep on turning at that rate and you keep on reading and assimilating that book at that same rate. Then you leave the book Go and kill a man and come back and try to read the book again. You can't read one page in one hour. What's happened? Your eyes are the same, you are the same. There's no connection between that man whom you killed and the book. What have you lost? You have lost the power to concentrate upon the book. That event of killing the man, extinguishing life like your own life, was such a big drag on you on the power to concentrate that you could not concentrate and maybe you take a month before you get back your speed of reading the book, maybe 15 days. On the other hand, you go and kill a dog and come back, you will still have difficulty in concentrating but for a much lesser period. The recovery time of your power of concentration will be less. If you eat an apple, it will be even less. That is why it was recommended by those yogis that if you want to practice concentration of attention, you must extinguish life which is necessary for subsistence of the lowest order, which distracts you the least. They became vegetarians. That was the reason. All these things came by practice. But here we find people discussing uh, diets, vegetarian or non-vegetarian, who in any case are not concentrating here, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> this is a the subject of food and diet is for those people who want to practice meditation, not for those who want to discuss meditation. You can discuss very well with meat food or without meat food, but you can't practice very well. But doesn't the diet itself have an effect on the body though? 
regardless of whether or not one is going into meditation, whether if one is a is a vegetarian, one is a, a meat eater, wouldn't it just have a, a different effects on the body? It does, but that's the minor effect. The major effect is on the power to concentrate, on the attention. That's the main effect. There are many other things. Body effects can be there. You have a heavy meal, it becomes difficult for you to concentrate. Heavy vegetarian meal makes you difficult to concentrate. <laughs> it's not merely that you can eat as much as you like and still say that the body will not distract you. The body draws your attention, then it becomes difficult to concentrate. We get so many hang-ups in the body, which make it difficult to concentrate. Each one of them have to be removed, minimized. But only those people can understand what I am saying, who have actually tried practicing concentration of attention at the eye center. And they know what comes in the way. They know the difficulties, then they appreciate what I am saying. But if we don't do that, and merely discuss intellectually the possibilities of meditation, the possibilities of God-realization, it means nothing. Some of this group is in marriage counseling. Do any of you have questions that are doing counseling? I have a question about, I'm not in a group, but uh, <laughs> anybody? you anybody? triggered something in my mind. Good. Uh, I had been attending a uh, Bible discussion at the university the last couple of weeks. And uh, attending classes there, Dr. Arya seemed to speak about uh, marriage as being sort of something that would uh, be distracting, that would not really be conducive to uh, meditation or self-realization, whatever you want to call it. But then recently, it seems like maybe he's talked more about marriage as you know, not as being all right. And uh, you know, I've heard some people say that that. Uh, Marriage can help you. Like I'm aware of the order of swamis. You know, those who really are intent on knowing themselves have chosen to renounce. And I would like to know if you have any feelings on, from really, you know, relations in the world, how they detract from, from or add to. Well, being married myself, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> and especially, you read especially, <laughs> and especially so. When my answer is being taped by Jimmy Jackson. <laughs> but I should say this. It is a very, very difficult question. To which there is no one answer. For this reason, that the ultimate object of meditation, of yoga, is to realize yourself. Realize yourself at your highest level. It's a tough question because the concept of self is tough and not easily understood. If you know what the self is, then there's no problem. I can give you an answer straight up. When we begin to talk of the self, we think this body is the self. Then we say, no, the body is not the self. We have to find our conscious self inside the body and we move on. So that imaginative self, which can look, see, hear without using these arms and hands. Imaginative self. You say, ah, that's the astral body. The body that still has sensory perceptions without the physical system. You say, ah, that's the self. And when we discover through further meditation that the sensory perceptions are not necessary to the self of consciousness, the senses are merely an adjunct, an aid to consciousness like the physical body is, we are able to leave the senses altogether and still have direct perception to our minds and we say, ah, that's the self. That's our mental self, sometimes called the causal self. And yet, with deeper meditation, under an expert adept or a master, we discover that even the mind is not our self. It's merely a cover, an aid, a garment around the self. Then we leave our mind and we find we are still conscious as a self. We say, ah, our soul is the self. The soul that has intuition, love and all that I was talking about the other day, that is the self, not the mind. And we feel very happy. Now we have reached the self beyond all these selves. Then we say, that's my soul, it's me. 
and that's his soul, and that's your soul. And we discover that, that is also not the self. Because when I say that's my soul and his soul, I begin wrapping it with a shawl of individuation, separation from others. The soul is never separate from others. That also is a shell around me, not the self. The shell of individuation. When I leave the, uh, the shell of individuation and become total, total consciousness, then I can say, that the self. At each stage, starting from the physical body till my total consciousness, each stage of successive experiences, the ones who are picking up experience are called the self. Now, if we recognize that all these are self, that being the real self, the others being self as covered by these covers, where does man-woman relationship come? That will answer the question about marriage. Now you find that in the total consciousness there is no man-woman relationship. And if you are seeking a knowledge of your total self, there is no question of seeking knowledge to man-woman relationship. At the soul level, there is very minor and a different kind of man-woman relationship. At mental level, sensory levels and physical levels, there is a big difference man-woman relationship. At different stages of our growth, the man-woman relationship becomes important or unimportant. Therefore, there is no direct question, answer to this question. It will depend on where you are aiming to go and where you are at the moment. So, depending upon where you are, this relationship becomes important or unimportant. If the man-woman relationship is phys physical, biological, physiological, through sex, it is through the body, basically. For this basic relationship, it can be a hindrance to realization even of your astral self. It can be a hindrance if you have a woman, it can be a hindrance if you don't have a woman. <laughs> and it can be different at different times. It can be different at different times. Therefore, you will have to have a specific answer for a specific person at a specific point of time in his meditation practice. There can be no single answer. But I have explained the background against which the answers will vary. Does it make sense? Sure, yeah. It makes sense. Do you want to go around the room and say which is which? Well, it's trial and error of really answering the question for each individual. It has to be an individual answer for an individual person. And each person, that is why we say that individual guidance is a must in spiritual growth. There is no such question that there is a book, there is no possibility of there being a book which we can all read and go through. Just not possible. It is not even possible to follow an institution or an organization and its established teachings and say we can go through. It's not possible. At every step, there are distinguishing features in our own progress. There is only one of them. Marriage or man-woman relationship is only one of them. There are several others. For example, the question of the nature of our ego. What is the state of ego at any given time? It's so unique and individual, there can be no single answer. How do we deal with the problem of ego? Well, somebody says, make effort. Well, if you make effort, you are increasing your ego. How are you solving it? And they say, surrender. Just give up. Okay, if you just give up, maybe a guy is not yet ready to give up. He has nothing to give up. Therefore, these are statements which are being made in books, in institutions, in lectures. They mean nothing in actual spiritual growth. For spiritual practice and for growth in meditation, you need individual guidance from an adept, from a master, who has gone through this personally and he knows you. He's, he goes inside you and he can tell you exactly what you need at any given time. Without that, you cannot make spiritual progress. Where do we find the spiritual path? Where do you find the yeah. that expert, a spiritual master? Well, you can't find him. He has to find you. <laughs> because if you could know who is the spiritual master, you wouldn't need one. 
he can find you. Therefore, the answer to your question is just be ready. If you are ready, he will come and find you. It's happened with everyone. You'll be amazed when you look around people who found the spiritual masters. When you are ready, he must find you. If he's a master, he must come and hold your hand. A blind person, a blind person cannot find the one who has eyes. Though, because he is blind, he thinks he can find. He gropes around. He says, I am going to find you, I am going to find you, and goes around. And the man who is looking with his eyes, he laughs. Ultimately, when he is groping around, he puts his hand in front. This man says, ah, I have found you. The blind man says, not only says, I have found you, believes that he has found the man with eyes. It was impossible for that blind man to find the man with eyes if the man with eyes had not put his hand forward. At the right time, when he felt that he's had enough of it, groping around. What is the state of readiness? That's your next question. How do you... <laughs> <laughs> I normally assume that it means because, you know, you go through these steps and then you know, well, that is part of the assumption. It is not a bad assumption to make. You are ready when there is a keen desire to know yourself. Even if the meditative process is not known to you. When in your heart, in your mind, you seek. Your readiness is measured in terms of the intensity of your seeking. You cannot be a disciple unless you are a seeker. And you are ready when you are seeking. And you are seeking when you are full of seeking. You say, I want to know. I want to know. Where can I find? If this question comes up strongly, the right guy will come around and give you the answer to this question. If you say, where can I find? He'll come and tell you. And you'll find. If our, if our questioning, if our desire to seek is strong, we always find. So, whatever we can do, meditation, whatever meditation we can learn, from wherever we can learn, whatever practices we can follow on our own, from books, from anywhere, if we go on following them, hoping that we'll find the expert, that's the best preparation one can do. And one should do it, and I tell you from experience, of quite a long time, over several countries, that when the disciple is ready, the master invariably appears. It's so good an arrangement as that. The master is God. He's God. Therefore, he knows. If he wasn't God, he wouldn't know where all these seekers are sitting and waiting for him. Since he's God, he's in every one of them. Therefore, he knows and appears. Appears in the most appropriate form needed by that disciple, needed by that seeker. Because he knows what we need. We don't know. We can only seek. But we must knock, we must seek, we must knock that it may be opened. Why is it uh, in the search sometimes a disciple may have, let's say, more than one master? He may have a master and say, well, nothing's happening. I thought this was it, but uh, now this other master has come along and he seems to be it. Why does this sometimes happen? These spiritual masters are clever guys, I must tell you. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, that they prepare you up to a certain level of education about yourself. When we go to school, we go to elementary school, we have small teachers. Later on, we become university students. And we know more than those teachers knew. When we are in the university, those high school educated trained teachers who taught us in elementary school were not so educated as when we get university degrees and become doctors, yet they were our teachers. At that time, when we were in elementary school, they were good teachers. We could not have sat down and said, I will only study from a university professor or doctor because I, I have to find the best teacher. The best teacher is needed at the occasion when you have reached that level to need a best teacher. When we are in elementary school, an elementary school teacher is good enough. 
So in course of education of our self, about ourselves, we find teachers at different levels. And as we grow in education, we have to move on to teachers who can teach us still higher. There's a very interesting story about our great master. Would you like to hear that Certainly. story about I have told it earlier. There was uh, an, an engineer, a roads engineer in Burma, who was very, very keen to find a master. And he said he'll give up anything to find a master. He was a very miserly person. You understand miserly? Yeah. Stingy. One doesn't want to spend. Every time he took out a rupee to spend, he would hold it in his hand and say, shall I or shall I not? For everything. And it was very difficult for him to spend even a single rupee. As a result, he filed up a bank balance of about 30,000 rupees. And he said, although I'm not willing to give one rupee for anything, if I find a master, I'll give my anything that he demands, any price. He was willing to pay a price. So in course of time, he heard that there was a master in the city of Madras in India. And he journeyed to the city of Madras because he heard that, that teacher knew exactly all that this guy wanted to know. So having gone to Madras, he met the teacher who was a very tough guy. He said, you have come for knowledge? He said, yes, sir. Are you willing to pay the price? He said, yes, sir. He said, what is the price, master? He said, price is how much money do you have? He said, I've got 30,000 in my bank. He says, okay, give all that to me. I'm going to make a temple here and I'll use it in my temple. Imagine the keen seeking of this man who wouldn't spend a single rupee, immediately drew out a check and gave him 30,000 rupees. He said, master, that's yours. I'm willing to pay the price. He said, oh, that's good. Now the money part is over. Now you have to do some body part the physical uh, price you have to pay. He said, what is that? He said, now look, my method of meditation involves tying up your attention with the breathing, with pranayama. And since you breathe through two nostrils, you divide your attention. You have to breathe through one nostril. And for that purpose, you have to alternately close one nostril, then the other one, and since by using the hand, the attention goes into the hand, you are not allowed to use the hand. And how do you do this strange sadhana? He said you do it by twisting your tongue back upon itself and from inside operating the two nasal channels and blocking one and blocking the other. In this way, but this guy was uh, uh, not smart enough, he could have asked, if the hand gets the attention, why not the tongue? <laughs> but he didn't. And he said, look, this tongue doesn't go around because it's tied down by the tendons. So these have to be chopped off. And since it's a question of price, I can't do it just a simple painless surgery. I'll sandpaper them for you. So you feel you have paid a price. It was a terrible torture. But look at the keen desire of this man that he went through this torture. Seven days, and he said, I won't do it all at once. Do it slowly so you know you paid the price <laughs> for self realization. This man paid the price. He suffered this torture for seven days. Then he had to get treatment to avoid infections and all that. But his tongue got loosened. And he practiced turning the tongue back, and he could breathe from either side. And he meditated in that situation. And as he meditated, he saw various lights and he saw many doors of perception opening up and he experienced many things. But he was not satisfied. He said, Master, I have seen very strange experiences, but I haven't found the self. I have found the experiences. I wanted to find the experiencer. Who is having these experiences? The Master said, I have taught you all I could. You have to go and find some other Master. He felt very disappointed. In course of time, he found the great master who initiated me. 
and he was able to get a knowledge of the experiencer, not only of the experience. And one day he was talking to the great master when I was just sitting there, by chance. So I overheard this conversation. And that's why I'm telling you today. He said, oh great master, what a fool I was. That all my life savings are 30,000 rupees. I gave away to that guy who didn't know anything more than just showing me a few flashes of light. How I wish that I had come to you and found you in time and I had come and given that to you as a price because you have given me a priceless gift of knowledge. And the great master laughed. That's the, the way of these masters. On such occasions they laugh. He laughed heartily and he said, My dear young man, you have given nothing at the wrong place. But when you came over to me, I got all that money transferred to myself. In your account, what he meant was that any effort made, any progress made under another master was part of the total progress made under the ultimate master who gave him knowledge. Nothing was waste. Therefore, you can have a succession of masters and ultimately find the perfect master who gives you total knowledge. Nothing is wrong. You go through preparatory schools all the time. What happens if uh, the first master had been called the perfect master? Is this just a matter of relativity for the particular disciple? Well, the, the disciple only knows his master when he reaches the level of his master. Before that, a disciple has no power to judge which master knows more or less. Because we don't know anything. How can we judge? So we go through this process and eventually reach the perfect master. But I can tell you this, when there can be a, another question of there being more than one perfect master. There may be five perfect masters. Then what happens? You may be around all those five. It's very rare. Even to find one is extremely rare. But it may happen. So by way of principle, we have a theory called theory of the marked sheep. That a perfect master has his marked sheep. He does not deal with the rest. When he has his marked sheep, he picks up his sheep. Even in a big crowd, he picks them up. They are drawn to him. How are they drawn? At the right time, when we are in the presence of such a master, we are sure he is the master. Without his speaking. We are not impressed by his discourse, but by his lectures, but not by his, not by his lectures, but by his presence. You can have several perfect masters. The one for whom you are marked will pick you up by drawing you to himself through his presence, not necessarily through his words. They are a clever lot. <laughs> <laughs> they know their business. <laughs> we can't sit in judgment upon them. Everybody has an Eventually, yes. Everybody who has even once thought of God, thought of realization, thought of going back home to where he came from as a master. And the master comes eventually, at the time when the person is ready. It may be after a long, long time, through time and space. It may not be this particular lifetime. But it comes. That was not a moment of question. Uh, I am just beginning to believe, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm considering the fact that there may be another life after this. There are many lives. And this business of having a master is related to several lifetimes of experience, not only this life. When we are born in this world, and the way we are born, the way we are given parents, the way we are given a certain life, the way we are given a start or a retardation or a handicap, the way these things are given to us would suggest that this is not an isolated package. There must have been something before. There must be something after. And those are different lifetimes before and after. A master picks us up 
in due course when we have progressed and prepared ourselves in seeking over several lifetimes. But we need we have no proof of these things. But we have nothing to go on. There is not a proof if we are willing to seek it. Proof will not come to us. We have to go to the proof because proof is lying where it belongs. The proof lies in our consciousness and memory. Supposing I say yesterday you did not exist, you won't believe me. Why not? Where is the proof that you existed yesterday? You remember. You remember. Okay. Supposing you can remember your previous life, isn't that proof for you? You can. Everybody can. It's lying here. The entire memory of our, all our previous lives lies within ourselves right now. All we have to do is to go within and see it. The proof is not very far. Nobody is to give it from outside. You, uh, supposing I give you proof, oh, yesterday you were there and you don't remember, you won't believe me. That will be no proof. If you remember yourself, it will be proof irrespective of what I say. In the same way, previous life is proof to ourselves by remembering it. Directly, personally, you get to know, ah, these are the same guys we are meeting again. You remember exactly what you were. Some people remember by accident. Some people remember, they feel they remember. They meet somebody for the first time. They say, now I have known this guy for a long time. They don't know why they are saying so. You go to a new place, completely new place. You say, haven't I been here before? It looks so familiar. And you have no reason why. Where is this feeling coming from? From memory. From a subdued memory. But if you go within yourself and see your consciousness operating, the full memory can come of the entire incidents that happened there. So proof is within us. It's not from outside. You have all the proof within yourself. Reincarnation that you have lifetime after lifetime, you don't have to take it on belief. Don't take it on belief. Don't take it because somebody else says, go and see the proof first. Then say, I know it. Don't say, I believe it. Say, I know it. Each one of us can recall our previous lives. And the capacity to remember previous lives is within ourselves. You see, the way I have looked at it is that our brain, you know, what's a brain that? A brain. Okay, that takes with it our knowledge, our, our memories. What, what, ha what happens uh, to the brain when we are a little unconscious? The whole knowledge system, memories, everything finishes. We just pass out, freak out for a minute. What happens to all the knowledge? Everything goes with the brain. And when we get up, the whole thing comes back. From where? What about the brain of a precocious child? We have a little girl there who can give you a calculation of any figures earlier than a calculator can do. Any figures. When did she learn it? The brain functions by learning. The physical brain, I'm talking about, which you are relying upon. The physical brain has no other process except learning. You teach it something, it remembers. And if there is no previous life, it cannot remember anything at birth. All things it remembers must be from this birth onwards. And yet it is doing things which it has remembered from earlier times. So many things it is doing. Where is it learning from? Where is it, where is it remembering from? It's a tough question. The best thing is not to go by belief on this or any other thing. I have been advocating that no one should enter this area on blind faith. I am a strong believer of living faith, provable faith, faith that you experience personally and not one that somebody else says they are for take. I wouldn't do it. How can I recommend you to do it? I never did it. Why should I do it now? I'll only accept that which I can experience myself. And I only recommend to you to accept that which you experience yourself. Till then, hold it as a statement. Somebody says this, okay, I hold it in a shelf. When I come to that bridge, I'll pass it. When I get that knowledge, I'll accept it. Don't accept it on blind faith from somebody else's statement. Accept it on your personal experience. I'll give you an example of personal experiences which leave us in no doubt at all. This personal experience of my talking to you can still be doubtful. It may be hallucination. I may not be there. This is not a very definite experience. But I'll give you an example of a definite experience which can 
never be contradicted. And that is the experience of waking from a dream. At night you go to sleep and you have a dream and then in the morning you awake. You don't ask for proof that you are awake. You don't open your eyes to see, am I awake? You don't pinch yourself if the body is real. You are still in the same bed. You are still your eyes closed. You are still in the same position. And yet you know you are awake. Not only know, you are sure. If the whole world were to come up at that time and say, you are still dreaming, you still know you are awake. They can't convince you otherwise. What kind of proof have you got that you are awake? It's that kind of proof that is needed for spiritual awareness. Nothing less than that. That is the proof of direct realization, direct wakeful state, direct raising of level of consciousness. That's what you have experienced. When you wake up from a dream into wakeful state, you have shifted your level of consciousness to a higher level of wakefulness. And that carries with it its own proof. The whole world can be on one side and cannot shift your conviction about that point. When you get to know about your previous memories at the astral level of consciousness, you get that kind of proof. Direct personal recollection of what you have been and what all the other guys have been who are around you. Nobody can give you proof or disprove at that time. You know it personally, directly. And I recommend, wait for that kind of proof. Don't accept anything on blind faith. Okay. Well, that was a nice discussion. Thank you. Enjoyed meeting everybody.